So last week we introduced uh, the units. So we looked at distributed paradigms. We also gave an assignment where you were supposed to summarize a short paper. So I've looked at some of the summaries. Some summaries are really good. Some summaries are not good for the ones that have been submitted. Some people have just uh, pasted things and put there. So it's evident as I look at the summary, it's evident uh, for those who read and were able to summarize it, I can see it. For those who have not done any summary other than copy paste, it's also evident in your work. So when you're given these things to read and summarize, try to do that. I know you have a lot of work, but try the best you can to do that. It makes your work easy. But then if you take shortcuts, then you'll find that your work will be really difficult at the end of the semester trying to understand concepts which other people understood at the beginning of the class. So today we want to look at service-oriented architecture, which is what you already summarized. So I'm just going to go through that. So it's an overview. Then uh, after this, by next week, I expect us to at least have set up our machines in preparation for c -sharp. So next week, you want to do something small on c -sharp. I think we can try message passing interface, MPI, but we will see. We can try that with c -sharp. Have you done Python? Python, have you worked with Python in uh, any other unit, previous unit? Ah, good. So if you work with Python, then we can even try the MPIs with Python first. To be, okay, it's, Python is also simpler. So we can try uh, MPIs. We have looked at message passing and we saw the different ways of implementing uh, message passing. And you said one of the ways of implementing message passing was using the message passing interface, MPI. And uh, you'll find that it's really used in parallel programming. So you'll find that with parallel programming, they're applying the MPIs. So it's just good to have an idea of how it works and what it is, so that, such that when somebody mentions it, you don't wonder. It doesn't feel like a new thing. So we are just going as we are testing our C sharp, and also we can go back to Python. Maybe we can start on Python. Okay, by next class we look and do it in Python, then convert it to C sharp. As we try and understand how C sharp works, then we create our services. So with a service oriented architecture. start with some architectures. So the first ones that were used mainly were mainframe. So you had your uh, mainframe computer, then you had uh, 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 more of an access point whereby you were able to access your mainframe computer. Then from mainframe computer, you had our client server architecture. So we had our clients and our server machines whereby with our client server architecture, we have really been discussing about it. So you have your PCs because the generation of PCs was introduced. So you have your PCs, then you have a server machine, whereby with the server machine, it's more of serving resources to the clients. And then apart from that, there was the NCR architecture. So from the client server, then we had NTA architectures. So with the NTA architectures, which was around 1990s to 2000s, main programming model was now the OOP. So you have this is what you have been summarizing. So you had your OOP. You have looked at the various uh, distributed object technologies that you were looking at, the DCOM, the CORBA, HSC. So they were also introduced when you had the NT architecture, then the, the, the distributed computing was introduced. Hence, these technologies uh, started coming up. So 
We all want to find out how did we get to know the service-oriented architecture because uh, the service-oriented architecture currently it's being used in various, it's applied in various places. One of the key areas that is being applied is, is cloud computing. So with cloud computing, it's using the service-oriented architecture. So you're going to find that even most people who have legacy systems, they're now trying to move from their legacy systems to a service-oriented architecture. So most systems are now being applied as a service-oriented architecture. So in our case, you want to look at service-oriented architecture, but in the case of web services. So on the web, but there are different ways or places where you can use that service-oriented architecture. So in 1980s, programming was done in form of functions mainly. So people were writing functions for each and everything. But then uh, with functions came about issues. One, maintainability was difficult. So maintainability, you want to maintain code, you want to have to read somebody's code so that you can change it. So it became really difficult. Reusability of code was also difficult with the functions. And with that, then we had the OOP, the objects. So with the objects, because the key agenda, because we had issues with reusability, then we have a key agenda of reusability where the objects now came in. So the objects, you are able to create our classes and create objects of the classes, hence reusability became easy. We could easily reuse uh, things. Then uh, with the OOP era, we still had issues. Now that we had our classes, so we have our classes, so each programming language had their own classes within the classes and create the objects as a class. But then again, we needed to interact. So different uh, classes made in different programming languages needed to interact. Because now with the way they had written their code, if you created your class, made in, for example, .NET, and another one made in Java, then these two could not communicate. So we needed a way for them to actually interact. So to be able to solve this particular problem such that classes made in different programming languages could interact, we had messages. So messages were introduced in the early 2000s. So with these particular messages, they were more of now allowing loose coupling. What do you mean when you're talking about loose coupling? Because uh, I'm sure you've really come across this particular one, because now we are now moving to loose coupling. What do you mean by that? Can write it in the chat. You can talk. So with these particular different classes that were made, then the messages were introduced to be able to communicate between the classes. So messages, things like XML were now introduced. So the standards such as XML were now introduced, which is one of the things that we are actually going to be looking at. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Calvin. So Calvin saying it's more of, we don't want a very strict architecture. So you want such that different devices with different architectures can easily communicate. So that's one of the uh, ways. Julie also talks about loosely coupled that applications work independent of each other. Uh -huh, that's very good. Also, Wangari talks about that there's little or no interdependence within the components in the system. 
Uh -huh, that's very good. Thank you for your answer. That's very good. So that's what we are emphasizing on. So they were more of now heading towards loosely coupled architectures, so loosely coupled programming. So there is also a concept of services. So with services, it's more of um, you're going to uh, look for here talking about self-contained business functionality. So with a service, it has everything. So one, it's more of um, an isolated thing. So with a particular service, it's more of also concentrating on one part and it's independent. So it's more of self-contained business functionality. So we're going to be creating services. So with the services, one of the ways the services communicate, the services will be communicating through the messages. So you want a service to be isolated such that if I change something on this particular service, other services will not be affected. So that's why you're saying it's self-contained, it's more of isolated. So if I change it, other services are actually not being affected. So you talked about services communicating with Order others the through messages. Order. They should Make be able to name. define themselves. Oh, oh, oh. Oh, then apart from oh. defining themselves, they should also be made in a repository where we can find them. So you're going to see that with services, they're actually defined and put in a particular place whereby Hey guys, make sure you remember can easily be found. So we have a consumer of a service. So with a consumer of a service, they can easily look for the service and get the service so that they can be able to consume the service. Then we also have to be able to orchestrate the services. That is, we can define the different workflows of the particular services. So for example, I have two services here. I have a security service. And then there is the order processing service. So with these two, I can orchestrate the service or define the workflow such that I can say maybe it's uh, we can start with the security service, then the order processing service, or we can start with the order processing service, then the security service. So maybe if um, there was something that a particular person was supposed to do, there is a flow of work. So you're now saying that before you get to this, please use this service first. So for example, if I wanted the security service first, then you make an order. Then the first thing I'll do is, for example, with the security uh, service, I check the user. So the user goes through the security. Then after the security, they can be able to place an order using the order processing service. Or oh, I can decide, first of all, they, uh, they place the order, then after placing the order, then they can go through the uh, security service. So the orchestration is just more of defining the flow of work. What comes before or after? So you've talked about the services being able to communicate with the messages. So with your service, you're going to have a service consumer and a producer. So there'll be the producer of the service and there'll be the consumer of the particular service. So with the consumers, consumers of a service can also be other services. Um, okay, there's a request about the recordings. I'm going to send the recordings. I'm just going to record. So then I send one recording. So don't worry about that. Okay, 
Yes, so going back, so you have your consumers and your producers. So there'll be where the services are being produced, then services can be consumed. You can have applications consuming that particular service that has been produced. You can even have other services consuming the particular service. So this one is just showing that the services are communicating by sending messages across consumers and producers. Yes, what do? So when you're talking about the messages, you see that the services will communicate by sending messages. So with the messages, the format should be standard and should be able to work cross platform. So we don't want such that the message is just working on one platform and cannot work on another. Because with the distributed systems, you'll find that they are different. They are heterogeneous systems that are communicating. So if they are different systems communicating, hence we have different platforms, then you want our messages to be able to work across platforms. Another thing about messages, they should be able to communicate asynchronously, reliably, and in a secure way. So we don't want uh, such that we are waiting for a reply from a message we can be waiting forever. So we want such that we have continuous communication, hence we want the asynchronous communication. We also want messages to be able to describe and discover a service because the messages is what we are now using for communication. Hence, we want them, we say that with a service, one of the things we said about a service is that it should be able to be placed or maintained in a repository where we can find them. So we want messages to be able to discover the service. So with the concepts, when we have our services, which we have talked about what services are, they are more self-contained and are able to communicate using messages and also can be orchestrated. And we also talked about the messages. We have talked about they should be reliable, secure, be able to describe and our service cross-platform and be able to follow industry standard, the services combined with the messages form now the service-oriented architecture. So with the service-oriented architecture is just an architectural style. So with this particular architectural style, we cannot really say that with service-oriented architecture, that uh, we can say that we can't say that this style is just for web applications or for this type of applications. We will find that with this particular architectural style, it is used in different places. So it is applied in different types of systems. You have seen even the cloud uh, cloud computing, also the system on the cloud, they can apply service oriented architecture. So it is just an architectural style. So it's not, uh, it's not a way of, uh, it's not a standard programming. Uh, way or something, it is just an architectural style. So it's a style for building, building business applications. If you want uh, loosely coupled services, then that's why the SOA. So SOA was also mainly introduced to promote loose coupling. So you've talked about it being an architectural style. So with this one, the components usually provide services to other components through communication protocols of a network because it's more of uh, it's more of applied now with distributed systems. So you're more of providing services to other components of our network. So it's just an architectural style. So with this one, it has some attributes. With service-oriented architecture, we are going to look at it. It's standardized, it's loosely coupled, which is one of the key things. It's reusable, can easily reuse the services. 
composable, auton uh, autonomic, cyclic, abstract, and discoverable. These are some of the things we also summarized in our assignment. We had the attributes, also the principles of service-oriented architecture. So we summarized uh, some of these things about service-oriented architecture. But before we get to that, so we have mainly emphasized that with a service-oriented architecture, it's more of uh, trying to come up to the main aim is loose coupling such that look at the monolithic systems, which were the first system, you'll find that they were really tightly coupled. Then we came to now when um, in early 2000s, that's when SOA started being introduced. So right now it's more of now more defined, but in early 2000s, still we were introducing it, trying to have loosely coupled programs. But right now, they have more of now decoupled programs. So you can find that right now, developers can actually create and coordinate microservices without any prior coordination with other services or with other, other developers. So you find that currently we can create decoupled systems. So what are these concepts behind service-oriented architecture? One of the concepts behind an SOA you'll find is a service, which we have said it's more of a a business function that is well-defined and self-contained. So it does not depend on the state of other services. Within a service, you can look at things like web services, you can look at things like data services, etc. So you're going to find that there are different types of services. So for us, we will just be looking at web services, but there are different types of Services. So when you look at web services, then it doesn't mean that a web service is the only service that exists. There are various types of services. Then another concept of SOA, you're going to talk about service contracts. So with a service contract, it's more of describing the service and the usage of the service. So we say the services, they have to be described. So a service contract usually describes the particular service that you're providing and how it will be used. Because uh, we have said that with uh, services, it will be more of really abstract. So you will not know anything about how it has been implemented. But then for you to be able to use a service, it has to be described so that you know with this particular service, what, how is it, uh, what does it even take in? For example, if it's parameters, what does it take in? How do I use this particular service? For example, if I have any service, uh, if, uh, for example, we have services whereby we want to see credit card defaulters, we want to see the list of defaulters, or maybe you have defaulted in different places. So maybe we can just have a service whereby you just run the person's ID number, for example, then when you learn, run the person's ID number, you can see their status. Are they defaulters? Are they no, no, are they are they, they are not defaulters? It is simple things. So you want a service whereby that particular service, you can just apply for easily used. So to be able to understand how a service works, then you need a service contract. We have talked about another the concept of loosely coupled, so loose coupling. You also want functional autonomy. So with functional autonomy, it has a, each and every service has a particular function. It has something specific that it's doing. So for example, you have maybe a payment module, so that particular service is maybe just for making payments, 
HSC C1, it to just have a particular function. You also want it to be abstract. So abstraction, consumer does not need to know the details of the implementation of a particular file. We want it to be as abstract as possible. They just, you just need a description of the service, then you implement or you can just use the particular service. So you don't need to know how it has been created. You also want it stateless. So what do you mean by stateless? When you're talking about stateless, when something is stateless, You can just write it in the chat. Because you want uh, your services to be stateless. You also want them discoverable. Because you talked about your services uh, being uh, described somewhere. So for the consumer to be able to use your particular service, then your service has to be discoverable because they have to know that your service actually, the service actually exists so that they can use them. Uh -huh. So we have a number of uh, answers in the chat. So Eric talks about uh, the services, service instances not being maintained. Uh -huh. That's very good. Brett talks about communication protocol in which no session information is retained by the receiver. Uh -huh. That's good. One year also talks about all information required to carry out an operation should be present in the requests. So that's very good. So we want our services to be secret. We also want them to be discoverable. So with the self describing uh, uh, with the service, it also has a self-describing interface. So with this particular self-describing interface, usually the service is self-described using the service signature. One of the things is the WDSDL or also the WADL. So Web Service Description Language. So that particular interface describes the service. So you see the service has to be described so that it can be used by the consumers. We have also talked about the orchestration. So the service, you also have with the services, you have to have more of a flow. So if I use service A, what is the next service that I'm supposed to use? Maybe it's a process, the whole process that I'm supposed to go through so that I can, I, I finish it properly. Maybe I'm, it's a transaction that I am doing. So with this particular transaction, maybe I'm supposed to access service A first, then access service B, then access service C. So with that, then we need to be able to have service orchestration whereby we now have the flow. So we have the particular flow of the business process. So with the particular process that you're looking at, then we need some flow. So we have the service having the orchestration. So this is just a summary by Yogish Hai about the services, which we have looked at most of these things. So with the service, it's an in divisible unit of work, which is independent of the protocol of implementation because you want it to be loosely coupled, so it's independent. Then uh, 
With the services we have a service producers, there can be multiple instances of the same service, but only one service producers, but multiple instances of the particular same service. So these are just characteristics of the service. We say the service can invoke other services because we talked about the consumers. We say the consumer can also be a service, consuming another service. So these are reference architecture. So you can look at the reference architecture. So within an SOA, we are going to talk about consumer interfaces. Then uh, we'll have some business processes. Then you have your services. So before your services, you have your consumer interfaces, then your business processes. Then with the services, they have the service components and the operational systems. So the operational systems, Will be more of data stores. So with the data stores, it's more of storing of the particular data. Then um, apart from this, we also have so we have the consumer interfaces where we talked about these ones can be end user applications so with the end user applications that's where you have your consumer interfaces then uh, with the business processes with the business processes you can talk about the services maybe the flow of services usually this is now in form of use cases so the business processes if it's a transaction how the, is it supposed to so you can talk about the business processes here. Then you have your business services. So with your services, then you have your business services. Then you can have now components that build the service. So that's where you have your so uh, service components. So they're simply the components that will be building your service. Then you can have your data models. So where, where you store your data, so more of your data repository. So if you're looking at your service-oriented architecture, then there are things that we will also be looking at. There will be more of integration of things. So that's why you're summarizing here. There will be more of integration of things, services, We'll have to integrate data, we'll have to integrate different platforms, we'll be integrating, so there'll be integration. We will also, when you're looking at SOA, we need to look at quality of service. What does quality of service entail? Because so this is one of the things we were summarizing. We have to look at quality of service, which will be entailing. So, okay, Victor, send your message. We'll have to look at the quality of the service that we are producing. So quality of service entails things like security of a particular service, reliability of a particular service. You want to talk about availability of the particular service. So Anything else that you can look at when you're looking at the quality of your service? You will also want to look at information. Uh -huh. Good, Stacey, looking about uh, transaction management. Uh -huh. So with uh, transaction management, will more of uh, be under information because you want to, with the information, you want to provide more of the business information. Remember, this particular architectures and all these things, key thing you're looking at is 
business processes. You want things to be able to flow. So it's usually more of business processes. So with that, we'll be looking at more of it under information because under SOA, you'll also need something to do with business information. You need to provide some business information. So quality of service is more of uh, what are they usually called? Aha, uh -huh, reliability of the messaging. Aha, uh -huh, that's very good, Alan. Reliability is also what you want to look at. Then you also want to look at governance, governance of the entire service oriented. So we can uh, break this down into components. So with a service-oriented architecture, you will have your services. Then after your services, you have your enterprise service bus. What's the work of an enterprise service bus? Because you have your service team, you have your enterprise service bus. Then you have your registry. You will be having your registry. Then you can now have your consumers. So here we have looked at consumers, maybe it's other applications which are outside. Your consumers can also be other services. So then you just have your gateway here. Not really necessarily, but you might also have it such that it now controls access to the services. What will ESB do? Enterprise service first. Enterprise service first. Uh -huh. To distribute work among connected components of an application. Uh -huh. That's very really good. So, how about uh, distribution of work, bread, distribution of work? Uh -huh. That's very good. So, you'll have your enterprise service box. So, your services will mainly also be communicating through the ESB. What about the registry? What will the registry be doing? What's the purpose of a registry? The registry. Okay. So the registry, uh, when you're talking about registered services and allow discovery through the advertisement of services, that's good. Calvin is talking about where services are published by the service provider and can be detected by the requester. Uh, good. Vanessa is also talking about it contains information about services, which is good. Stacy talks about it uh, can publish available services and resources. Good. Huh, that's good. So I see people did, people actually read through the notes. So you have your ESB. So with your ESB, we have seen that with the services, they will mainly communicate through the enterprise service bus. It also provides con connectivity, anything to do with the data transformation and the message uh, conversion. So, so any communication is happening through the ESB. Anything to do with the service management, monitoring and lo uh, logging, they happen through the ESB. So this is just 
a general component architecture run ESB. Uh -huh. Aha, solve contention between communicating service components. Aha, uh -huh. that's very good. I like that. We're looking at now the ESB. So this is just ESB. So if you're having, for example, these ones were your services, then you have the ESB more of. You can see it's controlling or managing what is happening on your architecture. So any messages, any communication, it's passing through the enterprise service pass. We have already talked about the registry. You also looked at UDDI, Universal Description Discovery Integration, the assignments of Mm -hmm. I think this one's okay. So this is still the ESB. So you have, before your ESB, you have your services, they have interfaces. So without ESB, then you'll find that a service is providing an interface such that other services can communicate with it through the interface. But then with the enterprise service pass, Instead of these interfaces, then we are communicating through the enterprise service pass. So with the ESB, now enables the communication in between the, among the services. So you've talked about the consumers, you've talked about the reg registry, and uh, the gateway, similar to ESB, but not really needed. Could be there, could not be there. So it's not really needed. So, but if it's there, it will more of do some of the work that ESB is doing. For example, translating requests and mapping them to the correct service. Just provide anything to do with API management, but that is not really necessary. This is just a diagram to just show what team we have been talking about. You have your consumer, consuming services, have your service descriptions, and your provider. Then this service broker, initially before the ESP, there was the service broker. So the service broker is also more of the enterprise service bus. So service broker, then you have your registry. So it's just what we have. Also still, this is just the same thing. Your consumer, your provider, and your registry. So request for a service. So we say we have uh, service descriptions, which are now posted. So once you describe your service, then consumers are able to we are able to request for the service once you have published your uh, service description. So they can be able to discover your service and be able to use the service. So they can know how to communicate with the service provider and be able to work or use the service. This is just also the same, I can say the same thing. Have your application and your business processes, then your service. So you have your services, your applications can now be able to get the services depending on which, uh, what they actually want to do. So whatever you want to do, just fetch the particular service and use them. Then, of course, with the services, the services can now be created based on different platforms also. We have your services. We have talked about the standards of SOA. One of the things you say we have quality of service, which the quality of service, you can talk about security, reliability, and anything to do with the transactions with the transactions 
you were talking about uh, these transactions you looked at them in database. So in the database where you have your acid properties, you looked at two-phase commits, ATC. So that is on a transaction. I think uh, that is what uh, somebody was talking about in the chat. Uh -huh. Who was it? Somebody talked about transaction. Stacy talked about that. So Stacy, you are correct. Transaction management part of it. Anything to do with the orchestration of the services should be there. Then how to send messages and the transport uh, platform. Then metadata. So this, uh, metadata is just a description about something. So description languages, the policies, it is. This is also an example. Okay, so I gave many examples so that we can just look at it from different angles. So this is still the same thing. You have your services, you have your registry, you have your description language which describes the service. So registry will point to the description and also points to the service. Then you'll find your service through the registry. Once you find your service through the registry which has pointed you to the description of the service and has shown you where the service is, then you are able to communicate with the services. So with the communication, you can use now the messaging. So here you're using XML messaging for writing on so. With these descriptions, I think when you look back also with when you're thinking about the core bar HSC, we had also the description languages we have your descriptions. Principles of SOA, we have talked about this loose coupling, abstraction, we're having a service contract. Services are reusable, they are more of, they can govern themselves. We are talking about autonomy of a service. Stateless, they are stateless. This one, that one, talked about that. Discoverable, so discoverability, we talked about that. And also composability. Can skip this ones. They can also be normalized to minimize redundancies. So you're decomposing the service to a level of normal form. So you don't want also, you don't want to repeat things. So you want one service to do one thing, then another service to be able to do something else. So you can normalize your services. And also with the services, you don't need to know where they are. So you have location transparency. So you don't need to know the actual location. Last thing, service development. So with the service development, we have looked at elements. So with SOA, we have talked about, you can have your, you can talk about applications, services, service repository, and the service bus. So the service bus, the ESB, the service repository, where the services are kept so that they can be discovered. Application front end can be a service consumer. Then within the service, you can look at the contract, which you've talked about service contracts. Then also interfaces, you've looked at also a service can have now the interfaces. With interfaces, I think you wrote something on interfaces when you're doing your OOP. So you have an interface, so you can have your interfaces. Then there is now the implementation of the service. So the implementation of a service, looking at the logic of that, how the service is being implemented, and the data. So these are just elements of the whole thing, service-oriented architecture. So there are different types of the services. So if we are looking at SOAP web services, so we can have, if you're looking at web services, you can have now the SOAP web services, you can have the RESTful 
web services. They're looking at the SOAP web services in terms of transport. You're looking at HTTP or HTTPS. In terms of content, you're looking at XML, so they communicate through XML type. If you're looking at RESTful web services, then you're looking mostly at JSON. In terms of uh, service definition, we are looking at WS, talking about uh, SOAP for services. We're looking at RESTful. We're looking more of in terms of WADPL. So these are just description languages. In terms of messages, you see now uh, these ones will be more of the message payload will be transported through the SOAP. This one, the message payload will be more of a JSON message. If you're looking at SOAP, service method is SOAP. This one's service method is HTTP. Security, in terms of security, SOAP web services are using different security, WS security. Sure about security, you have done in web security, so you know better about the security. So these ones also look at now different securities and then the Java specs. So with also SOAP web services, there are different frameworks that you can use to be able to come up with the SOAP web services and also RESTful web services. So there are many, I have not uh, listed all of them. So for us, we are simply going to now be using the .net, uh, .net framework for this particular class to be able to come up with the web services. So we'll use a .net framework at the same time we, yes, so you use a .net framework. So that is it for now. Unless you have a suggestion of using something different, it is for this particular class, we are recommended to use a .NET framework. So as you use a .NET framework, you can compare it to something else. So today I want us to just uh, stop there. So it was more of uh, what we have read, the summary of what we have read from the paper. I want us to look at C sharp. So I'm leaving the time for you to look at the basics of C sharp so that we begin with MPI in the in the next class. Or do you want us to do C sharp like uh, from scratch? What is a data type? What is a function? Should we do that? Or should I leave you to explore that? Then in the next class, we just go through it. We just start off with something. What do you think? With C sharp, what do you think? Do you want to? Uh huh. That's so, John. Ah, good. Okay, so many, most people are preferring that we can explore on our own. Should I now give you for the remaining time of the class so that you can explore it? So that in the next class, okay, good. Then in the next class, we can do a 20 minutes overview. Okay, yes, so that's what we'll do. So in the next class, we just do an overview, a short overview, then we now try it out with an MPI. So let me see, we can also, first of all, do it some Python, then also some C sharp. Then uh, in the other classes, we just build our services. Slowly as we build our services, we just look at also other things, maybe things like XML, syntax. So good. I think that's E. 
Okay, Daniel, I've seen your message, so I'll check it out. I think I've not seen the email, but I'll, I'll check it. So thank you. So you can add your name to the chat and also kindly ensure that you have posted the other assignment because we might not have time to see for cuts. So just try and do the assignment so that you can have your course of cuts. So thank you very much. Have a nice afternoon.